Who in space can be found to fill these seats? Jenna, Gan, Avon, Blake, Callie and Villa. Now that is genius. Together, their adventures astound. Plasma boat launched. Activate force wall. Activated. Staying with you requires a degree of stupidity of which I no longer feel capable. You saved my life. We all make mistakes. I don't think so. That would not be very clever. Why do you stay with Blake? Well, we really are on our own. Let's hope so. What do you suppose it is that's lurking out there? Launch the pursuit ships. Blake! It takes all my life. Destroy you, Blake. Blake 7, Saturdays at 6 and Sundays at noon. everybody welcome to an all new episode of the chronic rift it is i think quick april 29th 2018 sunday morning here on facebook live and today we're going to be talking about blake seven and when i say we i mean actually me i had two guests lined up one who bowed out early on and one who never responded to my confirmation email about appearing and as he's done actually in recent weeks uh, getting a little annoying, but what can you do? Um, yet I say all this and I'm excited. I'm still going to do this because honestly, listening last week to Ken Holzhauser talking about reboots and revivals and why some work and some don't and such, it got me thinking about Blake seven. Cause I just finished the run. And if there is ever a television show that requires a reboot, I won't even say revival because some of the cast members have passed, uh, but the concept itself could certainly do with a reboot. And the concept itself was well ahead of its time in terms of the levels of darkness and conflict that were on the show. We'll get into all that uh, here in this episode of The Chronic Rift. Before we do that, I want to talk about another reboot very quickly here that I just finished watching last night, and that being Lost in Space. I loved it. Oh my God. I'm, I'm not going to get into spoilers here. We're going to be spoiling the hell out of it in a couple of weeks, actually beginning of June when I've got a crew coming in. And yes, you know, even though it's been me a couple last couple of weeks, I do have people who are excited to talk about other topics. Blake seven, for some reason, I had a few other people who said they would have liked to have, but they had work related things to deal with. Um, it's funny with Blake seven because I get people who are like, yeah, I'd like to. I get others who are kind of like, eh. And then I get others who are like, what? Which is why I was like, yeah, we have to talk about Blake 7 here. But Lost in Space. Finished it last night. And I'm going to say, because I've seen a lot of posts from people who are like, after two, three episodes, I gave up. You know, I, And you know what? That's your business. That's, that's fine. That's what you want to do. Go right ahead. Knock yourself out. But I have to say, you really should watch it through till the end. And if you didn't like it, try not to badmouth it, because honestly, God, it really was a great little series. I mean, is it going to change the world? No. But in this day and age of where things are so dark and gritty and moody and stuff, yeah, it has its dark moments. Yeah, it's got, you know, the Will Robinson character having, you know, test anxiety and such like that. But he overcomes it. There, he'll, he'll have his moment to shine. And I got to say kudos to Kevin Burns, who, you know, has been holding on to the torch for so long for lost in space for getting this off the ground and so looking forward now to season two of the series now uh one last thing before we get into this blake seven discussion here i just want to remind everybody that this friday night i start my osi files podcast here on the chronic rift network it actually won't be airing here on the chronic Rift page you have to head over to the osi files page but eventually it'll show up on the chronic rift page as well um, going to be talking about Six Million Dollar Man and Bionic Woman, some of my old time favorite shows. And I'm approaching it from the perspective of nostalgia, just like everything else I've been doing. I mean, but really nostalgia, trying to hit upon the 70s uh, feel 
of the day. And, you know, I've had a few people who've like been a little negative. I don't know why. Why does that keep doing that? Now it's last week. It was the light stream. This week, I seem to be going from dark to light. This happened a few other times as well. I don't get it. Is it me? Is it? All right. Maybe I should have white papered this whole thing before I started. But anyway, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, about the uh, nostalgia thing. I've been posting a lot of videos and newspaper clippings that I found trying to just stir up people's memories of the show. I mean, I know they have their own memories, but there are things that it's like, wow, when you when you go back to nostalgia. And some people have been like going, really, you know, what are you doing with this? And it's like, I find it fascinating. And it's what I want to share with my audience. It may not be everybody's cup of tea, like Lost in Space isn't. Like you may find as we discuss Blake 7 here today, it's not for you. But that's why, you know, there's vanilla and chocolate. Go choose something else then. Um, but I'm looking forward to this. And what I'm going to do is I was supposed to do a little something Friday night uh, to sort of get things rolling with the show. Just a little test thing. And it didn't work out because we had a little bit of an emergency here. One of my cats, it turns out, has a... UTI, urinary tract infection. She's doing better, though. She's been getting uh, antibiotics and such, and, you know, she's going to be cool. Uh, her name's Kelly. But anyway, uh, I thought what I would do is, like I said, I, I'd show some of these videos and stuff and add that into the whole conversation as well. So, you know, if you got a chance tonight, head on over. I'll put a link up on the Chronic Rift page to the OSI Files page here on Facebook. Head on over to it on Friday night when we begin our discussions proper for the show. Uh, but I just wanted to share, just see if this stirs some memories. Because these are uh, promos that I found that I never knew existed for the shows. Let's start first with the $6 million man going all the way back to the beginning before the bionic sound effects and, and all were recognized. <laughs> New on Friday, the six million dollar man. There's never been anything like him. Part man, part machine. It's a one chance, one man operation. This one man broke through a stone wall with a big aid or use of explosives. He's the top secret weapon that no one can stop. How are you able to do that? Violence. Lee Majors is the six million dollar man. Every Friday, beginning January 18th. Now, most of that footage, in fact, I think all that footage was from the pilot episode. Not sure if this was supposed to be the introduction to the series of movies or the introduction to the television show, because Six Million Dollar Man had an interesting history. It started in March of 73 as a pilot movie. Uh, some argue it wasn't a pilot movie, but whatever, um, because it did lead to two more movies in the late 73, no, 74, in the 74, early 74. No, wait a minute. Let me, I'm getting my days mixed up here. It was... 73 March for the pilot and then late 73 for the two movies. And then January 74 started the series proper. And then from there, as many fans know, um, they introduced a character, Jamie Summers, who would become the bionic woman. So popular that even when they, she died, they brought her back. So she got her own show. The $6 million experiment worked once, but will it work for the bionic woman? Now, she's faster, stronger than any woman alive. She's the most powerful woman on Earth. What exactly is it that Uncle Sam expects in return? Well, I guess he wants you to be part of the team. She's our country's most valuable secret weapon. The Bio Woman. All right. So, you know, if you get a chance tonight, I'll be on at around 9, 9.30. You'll see if you go over to the OSI files, you'll there'll be a notification up for it. And then starting Friday night and for the next 13 weeks or so, as we cover the first season, um, Six Million Dollar Man, Friday nights at 930 over on OSI files. And the feed will eventually be here, uh, or at least the audio will eventually be here in the uh, feed for The Chronic Rift. Now, moving on to Blake 7. Blake 7 was a TV series created by Terry Nation back in the... Late 70s, it was like 76, 77. Um, he had done work before with uh, Doctor Who. He was the creator of the Daleks. Um, and he had also done a television series that I also loved called Survivors about the remaining human population after a virus wipes out a majority of the human population and how they come together as 
uh, a group of people and such. And, and, you know, without the technology, without business, without as local groups started forming and stuff and forming their own governments and such, it was really interesting. So he goes and he takes sort of that sort of same depressing type of thing and takes it off into the future. And what he did was he basically... And I don't know if he thought about this afterwards, if it was all on purpose. I'm sure there would be other fans who know better. But he basically did Star Trek if Star Trek were run by evil people. And I know many people say, well, that's the mirror universe. But I I, I think in the mirror universe, they're all just mustache twirling type people a lot of times. I don't think there's a lot of nuance to what Star Trek did with the mirror universe. Whereas Blake 7 clearly is. It takes... I mean, even just the, the Federation logo is is tilted on its side as the logo for uh, Blake 7. Uh, in it, the main character, Raj Blake, who is a freedom fighter trying to overthrow the oppressive Federation government that rules over most of the planets, um, is, you know, basically taken down not by an assassin, because if they kill him, he becomes a martyr. What they do is they basically, and, and this is what I loved about it. I mean, it's creepy, but I loved it because it's so dark for 70s television. The Federation sets him up as a child molester. He's put on trial and found guilty, and he's sent off to a penal colony. Uh, I mean, and that's all in your first episode. It's like, oh, my God. you know. And, of course, what do you do? You discredit the credibility of someone who is trying to do the right thing, um, something we see a lot today. And anyway, en route to the penal colony, he uh, is able to escape thanks to the folks who are running the ship stopping to investigate this large vessel that they've discovered that they think they can use to their advantage. But Blake and several of the crew of not the crew, but the other prisoners are able to escape and take over the ship. Not even really take over the ship. The ship sort of welcomes them and accepts them as... Um, captain you know accepts blake as captain uh the ship then is named the liberator and blake and his crew begin a quest to overthrow the federation now the only sad part about the whole thing was they bring up this whole thing about his child molestation in that first episode it's never touched upon again in the series when blake tries to recruit other members or other groups and 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 such it's never like oh you're blake the child mol it's always then you're blake the rebel, the your Blake, the resistance, you know, and, and, and such. Um, there were four seasons of the show, uh, one, two, and three came yearly. And then there was a one year gap for the fourth season. Now, what's interesting about Blake seven, like in many respects, Dr. Who. So if you're a Dr. Who fan, you might also appreciate this. So the cast was not constant. In fact, the show's called Blake seven. Raj Blake left after the second season. Each season had 13 episodes, so there's actually only 52 episodes in the whole series. So it's also easy to watch in terms of time. Um, but he left in after the second season, and uh, the secondary character, who had become popular over the first two seasons, uh, Kara Avon, who is this computer genius who'd managed to try and uh, uh, swindle the Federation banks of its money, but got caught, um, he takes over. Now, Avon is always out for himself, but there's something about Avon in the shift from the second to the third season where suddenly he takes on the mantle of rebel leader. Now, I know there are people who don't like that because they always like the idea of Avon being out for himself. And we do see moments of that in the third and fourth season. But I always did like it. I always thought, you know, Avon brought something out good. Or not Avon. Blake brought something out good in Avon. Um, but anyway... I'm, what I want to do is this. I want to make the argument that this show needs to be rebooted. And I'd love for you all, if you get a chance, go check it out. There are, you didn't hear it from me, although you are hearing it from me. There are all the episodes up on YouTube, if you're here in America. Over in Britain, they've got the DVDs released. In fact, I think they actually are planning or just re-released the whole series uh, cleaned up and stuff. I wish they would bring it over here to the United States, or at least if BBC America would air it, like, say, on a Saturday morning or something. Um, that, that would be awesome, too. Wouldn't that be if BBC America did, like, a classic science fiction, like a British science fiction block every Saturday morning, Doctor Who, Blake 7, some of the other things, tripods? <sighs> oh, well. I guess that's what BritBox is for. Um, anyway, so... You've got four seasons. The first two seasons are pretty much self-contained. If you just watch that, you'd be dealing with Blake overall. 
uh, rather than the whole series. Because, as I say, Blake leaves at the end of the second season. The first half of the first season sets up everything. It sets up all the characters. It sets up all the villains. And Blake 7 also had some of the best villains overall. There was Servalan, the most evil woman you'll ever meet. She, you know, When she smiles at you, don't smile back. You've got to watch what you're doing. And that's something else I love because she was this strong woman in the 70s and she was holding it down. Even though, yes, she was a baddie, she was holding it down. And I have to say, even for her evil ways, she was damn sexy. Uh, I could see what Avon saw in her. Uh, and also, Blake had a foil besides Servalan and besides Avon, who the two of them were constantly at odds with. But he also had a foil in Travis, his enemy of sorts, someone who was sent out by Servalan to capture Blake. And a number of the episodes is always about the, the give and take of the two of them. In fact, what I want to do is I want to just like start you off right now, show you a scene here from the first season of Blake seven. The first time Blake and Travis have met for the first time in a while. Um, when Blake realizes that Travis is the one hunting them. And basically he thinks he's got, well, he does have the drop on him as you'll see here. Trick I learned from you, Travis. I got here first. Take his gun, Kelly. Know this. Your interrogators cause me much suffering. I should like a reason to kill you. One small movement will be enough. I've got her, Jenna. Bring the ship to teleport range. On our way. Now, Travis, your turn. You get in the chair. Don't feel too badly, Travis. After all, it was an ambush technique you devised. You're not out of this yet. Blake's ship is moving. Coming in very fast. We'll be leaving in about three minutes. I should use the time to think of an excuse for your failure. You'd better kill me, Blake. Until one of us is dead, there'll never be a time when I won't be right behind you. If not you, then somebody else. Killing you will change nothing. You don't matter enough to kill, Travis. Blake, get down! Ah! Door caddy, they'll be coming! How long, Jenna? 90 seconds. Make it faster. They're coming. Get down! Now. It doesn't matter about me. We're bringing you up. I order you to take them! Don't stand there, you idiots! Launch the interceptors! Welcome back. We thought you decided to stay. A bit close that time, Jenna. Anyway, we're glad you're safe, aren't we? Aren't we? Yes, I'm glad you're all right. Those interceptors will be lifting off any minute now. Let's get on with it. Gan, get the ship moving. Full interceptor evasion. Check. Zen battle computers to interceptor evasion. Then take us out. Speed, standard by six. Your instructions are confirmed. Now, as you can see, there's a lot to unpack there in that scene. First off and foremost, you might look and say, oh my God, look at the um, costuming. Look at the prosthetics, for instance, on Travis, the bad guy. I mean, he's got an eye patch. He's got a bionic arm, which has a weapon attached to it. You might be like, oh, geez, it's so cheesy. Well, yeah, it's the 70s. But if you can look past the set design, if you can look past some of the costuming and stuff, to me, it was the dialogue. Uh, the first time I ever heard that di that line, and it's been used in other uh, TV shows and movies since then. But that first time I ever heard that line was Blake Seven when Blake utters, you don't matter enough to kill. And to me, that had a, a deep impact. I was like, yeah, it's like you really saying, you know, you don't matter in my life. Like many people kill because it's like, OK, it's convenient to have you out of the way. It's like, you know what? Live or die. It doesn't matter. You don't matter. And to me, that's a greater insult. Uh, so I loved that line. And there are so many great lines of dialogue in Blake seven. There's a lot of discourse about, you know, what does it mean to be free and such? 
And you saw there at the very end when Blake teleported, another thing too, another Star Trek thing they lifted was the teleport. Only the Liberator had teleportation capabilities, at least in the first three seasons. The Federation had always been trying to develop teleport and failed miserably. But um, at the very end, you saw there the two characters. One was Villa saying, aren't we glad to see them back? And the other one is Avon. You know, and he pauses a moment and he goes, yes, we're, we're very glad to have you back. Now, I I just loved Avon. And it was in the second season that that love for Avon just solidified um, as the antagonism between him and Blake. Because, you know, you kept wondering, it's like, why is Avon here? If he's so miserable, if he doesn't like what's going on here, if he questions every motive that Blake does. Why does he stay on? What is he looking forward to? And we kind of get that answer in the second season, because in the second season, they built up a recurring uh, theme going through it. The first season was about the gang getting together. It was about introducing all the characters and then also ultimately leading to them finding the master computer Orac that they steal and use throughout the series. Um, but in the second season, they set up the whole thing that now, now that they've got the gang. Now that they've got all the, the people they need, it's time to strike back. And they discover that the Federation has a weak spot. It's basically their center of control. And when we say control, we're talking about everything that controls all the security systems, all the uh, peace making. Uh, I'm trying to think of the word, that, but basically because many of the worlds are, are the, the population are drugged and kept docile. And that's all done through machines. And all these machines are controlled through one local uh, planet, outpost, what have you, called Star One. And they figure if they take out Star One, then not only can they start the revolt, but so can everybody on the other planets and such. Um, but the problem is, is just as they're about to, to destroy Star One, they discover that there is an invading force from Andromeda coming in. And in destroying Star One, they'll also be dropping the protective shields around our galaxy. So it's like, okay, do we take care of the Federation or do we turn around and help in the fight against uh, the attacking forces from Andromeda? So you got all this going on. And then you come to this final scene with Blake and Avon talking about the whole experience up to this point. And this is where you come to understand who Avon really is. And this is why I love Avon. And this is the scene. Why are you listening to this drivel, Blake? You can take Star One. Let's get on with it. Very stirring. When did you become a believer? Are you just going to sit there? You have led them by the nose before. Excuse me, are you going to answer her question? Show me someone who believes in anything, and I will show you a fool. I meant what I said on Goth, Avon. We are not going to use Star One to rule the Federation. We are going to destroy it. I never doubted that. I never doubted your fanaticism. As far as I am concerned, you can destroy whatever you like. You can stir up a thousand revolutions. You can wade in blood up to your armpits. Oh, and you can lead the rabble to victory, whatever that might mean. Just so long as there is an end to it. When Star One is gone, it is finished, Blake. And I want it finished. I want it over and done with. I want to be free. But you are free now, Avon. I want to be free of him. I never realized. You really do hate me, don't you? When we have dealt with Star One, I will take you back to Earth, and then the Liberator is mine. Agreed. Agreed. Assuming the others go along with it. Why should we? Yes, why should we? It's all a bit high-handed, if you ask me. Liberator is approaching Sector 9. Navigation computers now require further instructions. Well, do we look for Star 1? We'll finish what we set out to do. Nothing else is settled. Are we fanatics? Does it matter? Many, many people will die for that Star One. I know. Are you sure that what we're going to do is justified? It has to be. Don't you see, Callie, if we stop now, then all we have done is senseless killing and destruction. Without purpose, without reason. 
We have to win. It's the only way I can be sure that I was right. That you were right. Course for Sector 11 is laid in. Detectors on full range. All readings are clear. Weaponry system on standby. Standard by six, Jenna. Run course program, standard by six. Confirm boundary. Confirm Liberator is now crossing the theoretical boundary of the galaxy and is entering intergalactic space. Increase speeds to standard by 12. Now, it looks like from the start that this whole thing has just been about Avon getting the ship. And yes, he's always wanted the Liberator. But the thing is, once he gets it, when we get to the third season, he continues the fight for Blake. To me, I think people miss the nuances of Avon. I think they missed out, for instance, when when Blake says there in that scene, you know, you really hate me. Avon never answers. It's a simple matter. Oh, yes, I hate you. No, he doesn't do it. He just says, I get the Liberator. I think what really happened here was, and we see it, there's little germs of it throughout the whole first two series, is that Avon is affected by Blake's, what seems to be Blake's selfless behavior. But he knows it's not entirely selfless, because there's Blake also at the end going, I have to know that I was right. And Callie, who's the telepath on the show, um, looks at him and goes, but you were right. You know, I mean, th it's the same mentality we've got today. It doesn't matter how we go about what we're doing. You know, uh, Democrats, Republicans, MAGA, whatever. As long as we're right. You know, facts don't matter. Nothing matters. It's just I'm going to keep screaming it until then. And Blake, in a way, is kind of like that, too. He's just a calmer version of it as he's saying that. And that's a little scary. It's like you don't even really know entirely what you're doing here. You just think I got to be right and I got to win at all costs. But Avon still sees there is a certain germ of something good in everything that's going on here, and he's affected by it. And that's why he picks up the mantle in the third season. Now, a couple of other things you may have noticed in, in that scene there, because we got a better look at the bridge, the, the control deck for uh, the Liberator there. Um, there's the separate stations where everybody is working different things, whether it's weapons or the flight or navigation or what have you. So you've got those kinds of things kind of very, you know, Star Trek ish there, but then in front you've got this, you know, and I always love that. I mean, to me, I was like, I wish I could go back in time and visit that set. I just want to sit in those seats. It's just this whole comfortable area there, but it's their meeting room. They don't have to have, you know, a briefing room like on Star Trek. That's their briefing room. It's, it's very convenient. But it's also very, again, like Star Trek The Next Generation. In fact, it's before Star Trek The Next Generation's time, a good 10 years beforehand. Um, and finally, one other thing to note there, Zen, the master computer of the Liberator. Loved the voice of Zen, played by Peter Tuddenham, who passed away a number of years ago. Big Finish has been doing a series of Blake 7 audios, continuing the story, and they found a very good voice actor whose name escapes me at the moment, who's able to mimic both Zen and Orac, both computers that are under Blake and then eventually Avon's command. So uh, without too much in the way of spoilers, because again, I, I want this to be a look at 40 years of Blake seven, but I also want this to sort of be a way to say to some of you, if you've never seen this show, as I'm discovering more and more people saying, it's like, you'll go, Hey, let me go take a look over on YouTube or, Hey, you know, I've got a multi play, uh, range DVD player. Let me go get the DVD set from, uh, you know, England and such. And I'll, I'll take a look at it here. Uh, eventually though, Blake and, uh, Jenna, the pilot, uh, the blonde one there, um, both leave the series and Avon picks up the mantle. He continues with Callie and Villa Villa, who is the master thief there. Uh, another character of mine that I, I happen to be very fond of um, out of all the actors who are participating from the original series in the new Blake seven uh, audios from big finish. He is still uh, Michael Keaton, the actor still of the strongest voice, like to me, I can close my eyes and I still see Villa from the 70s, whereas Paul Darrow, who plays Avon, while he's still got all the intonation and everything, you can hear the age in his voice. It takes you away a, a little bit sometimes, but not entirely. He's still Avon, you know, and that and I love I love Avon's swagger. I love and you don't see it there because it's a bit more on the dramatic side. But there are times where they are so 
chewing nails or what, what was it? You know, it's it's so hammy. And that's part of it. I mean, sometimes there's so much dia- – there's some dialogue that, yeah, you're like, oh, my God, I can't believe it. But they say it with such conviction you accept it. Um, but anyway, third season, they move on. They pick up some new crew members in Dana and Tarrant. Tarrant was apparently a name that uh, um, Terry Nation was obsessed with because he used Tarrant in a couple of Doctor Who Dalek stories as well. But they pick up – these two new members and basically Avon continues on, but he's terrible at it. That's, and that's the beauty of it too. He's terrible at being a leader of a rebellion group. So he needs to go find Blake. And a part of the whole season is hearing the rumors of him, of that Blake is alive. So he's, he's spending the time looking for Blake. There were a lot of one-off episodes that didn't really advance the plot, but gave us some great moments. One in particular is called City on the Edge of the World. Uh, There's another nod to Star Trek in its own way. City on the Edge of the World. Uh, A couple of weeks ago, we talked about Colin Baker, and I mentioned his appearance on Blake 7. And again, another memorable moment here as Villa is being bullied or, or intimidated. Intimidated is the better word. By Colin Baker's Babin the Butcher. This world and the next, that could mean anything. Not anything. Everything. There's nothing on this planet, Villa. No precious metals, no gems, no wealth of any kind. And why? Because it's all in there. This world. And the next? A religious mumbo jumbo to keep the locals out. We had to kill six of them before they'd even tell us it was there. And six more to make sure they didn't know how to open it. Well, what about the crystals you swapped for me? They're valuable. Where did they come from? They didn't. The crystals in that box? There weren't any crystals in that box, were there? So Tarrant did a deal with you without even seeing the merchandise. Oh, not with me. With them. Uh, Tarrant didn't even know I was here. But he did see a sample. I've had it for years. Lucky piece. Not so lucky for him, though. Wonderful. Me, he calls stupid. Not anymore. Smile. You outlived him. What? Well, we couldn't let them go back empty-handed, could we? So we gave him a bomb to play with. A bomb? Yes. Bang. You're dead. You know the sort of thing. Callie. What do you say? Can I ask you if you've tried to blast this? Blast it? We blasted it, burned it, drilled it, cut it. How long do you need? I don't know. You've got an hour. You, out. Leave my man in peace. And you. My mother. Oh, yes. I had a mother. Wonderful woman. Truly evil person. She had a saying. Babe, she used to say. She called me babe. Babe, she used to say. Treat every hour as though it's your last. I'll be back in an hour, Villa. (laughs) Tarrant, I hope you're satisfied. So, you know, you can see that because that's an early appearance of Colin Baker there between that and his appearance as the Chancellor Guard in Doctor Who Arc of Infinity. Why he got the notice of John Nathan Turner and also probably his appearance on the brothers as well. But just, you know, scenes like that. I don't know. It's just you don't see dialogue like that. You don't see fun things like that. I think the closest thing I'm seeing to that kind of thing now uh, I just finished watching the last of this season's Legends of uh, Tomorrow. Fantastically fun series that manages to mix the drama and the kitsch and the comedy. And even when it's over the top, you know, you're still sitting there going, OK, this is fun. And and that's Blake 7. But at the same time, still dealing with issues that are relevant to us as people and still taking a look just as Star Trek did. That's the thing. Still taking a look at, and not always, not always. It's not as heavy handed um, as, as uh, Star Trek can sometimes get with, with their look at themes and such. Um, Finally, we move on to the fourth season. The series took a year gap 
uh, break. And when it came back in the fourth season, um, Callie had been lost uh, at the end of the third season. The Liberator. Uh, the only other time I ever cried for the destruction of a ship. And when I say cry, I don't mean I was bawling my eyes out, but I teared up. Um, the Enterprise being the other in Star Trek Three, The Search for Spock. But the Liberator, as it died, in particular Zen, the master computer, as it basically lamented the fact that it couldn't save the crew. Uh, but Avon and the others, including Orak, the computer, managed to get off ship. And they're rescued by this man who... Uh, has a ship called the, oh God, I'm forgetting the name. His his master computer was called Slave Scorpio. Scorpio was the name of the ship. Sleek little planet hopper, they called it. Although for a planet hopper, it managed to travel great distances over the fourth season. Uh, the man who runs it has his own dark little past that uh, threatens our crew. And so they're able to overcome him, take his ship, take his base that he runs the ship from. So now... For the fourth season, they've got a base of operations. So not only do we have the ship, but we also have this base on this planet. So we get some scenes on the planet side. We get scenes within the base. And Avon starts to try to bring together the different rebel groups to try and form a larger cohesive unit in fighting the Federation. During this time, while this has all been going on, Servalan, and you know, remember I, I, I completely forgot about bringing her up, uh, she's gone from being a, um, a representative for the Federation to the president of the Federation in the third season. And then when they thought she was dead, she becomes a new character named Commissioner Sleer. She sort of reappears and is able to establish herself as accredited commissioner, although Avon and the others know otherwise. Anybody who finds out, though, she goes out of her way to kill them because she's not ready yet to resurface as Servalent because many people blame her for the disaster that occurred with the Andromeda attack on the Federation. Um, and the fourth season goes along. I, I, it's not the best of the series, but what's interesting to note is that when I tried to watch Blake 7 the very first time, I was put off by how dark the very first episode was. I was put off by the idea that, you know, Blake could be accused of child molestation and, and it easily bought and you could fix it all up and, and he could be brought down. I didn't go back and watch the show the next week, and I didn't watch it for a long time. Then, what, months later, because it's 52 episodes? Yeah, well, almost a year later, uh, we're getting to the end of the first run of Blake 7 here in New York when it first started. And I happened just one evening to be passing, and I thought, oh, look at the set design. I got, I got caught up in the set design because I thought it was interesting for some of the fourth season episodes. I forget which one it was. Might even be the one that I'm going to show you the clip for. But anyway... Um, I found it fascinating. So I watched through to the end and, and the very shocking ending for the series, which wasn't an ending. It was meant to be a cliffhanger that was going to be resolved with a fifth series. Unfortunately, Blake seven didn't get picked up for a fifth series. Uh, but I thought it was fascinating. So I went back and I watched again. And this time I watched it straight through. I stuck through it. I stuck through that first episode um, and, and as depressing as it could be at times and such. And I was hooked. I was hooked. It, it takes several viewings. I will also say that. It does take several viewings uh, to really appreciate. To really appreciate. I mean, you can watch it and be like, all right, that was cool. But to really appreciate the nuances of Blake 7. Like I said, I recently just finished another rewatch because I do love this show. Um, but we're still dealing with, even with the fourth season, we're dealing with some of the ideas, the themes that are, you know, important to us as people, including how our technology could try to take over from us if we let it get out of control. In this scene from fourth season episode called Headhunter, probably one of my favorites from the whole series. Prognosis, Orak. Prospect for organic humanoid life is dependent on one condition. Condition still. Connection. Dependent on one action. Let me get Avon back to base. Requisite action must be carried out first. It is imperative. Philip, take his feet. Sullivan, bring Aura. Why? Just do it.
Did it work? The inhibitor head. Like a charm. Good. That circuit influencer will be invaluable to us as a weapon. Organic humanoid life are now secured. Muller's android gone to the great cyberneticists in the sky. You fool. It's superstitious halfwits like you who hold back every advance we make. And arrogance, Avon, like yours and Muller's, which threaten to destroy. Shut up! Yes, master. Arrogance like yours that threatens to destroy. I, I just loved that. The whole episode dealing with this new form of technology that was getting out of control. It was in the form of an android that was threatening all of humanity. And Orak knew it. And he was trying to get the others to understand. But even the, the cyberneticist, the, the computer whiz, was more fascinated with how this thing could be weaponized. And so he was working through another character, Su Lin, who took over for Callie in the series, uh, Glennis Barber, the actress, uh, trying to convince her that he was right and you had to listen to him. And it's just, you know, that kind of stuff. I love it. I love that kind of interplay, that kind of discussion that goes on and such like, are we becoming too reliant on our machines? Are we becoming too reliant on our technology? We see this whole thing now going on here with Facebook and, and you know, the whole issue with Zuckerberg and, and all that. You know, I, I make the argument here and I put it out there to anybody who happens to listen to this podcast who's involved in Hollywood. This show needs to be brought back. This show needs to be rebooted. Joel Eisenberg, if you're listening, all right, get a look into the rights of this show and see what can be done through your production company to see about doing it. Because a new Blake 7 television series, I know Big Finish is doing the audios, and that's fantastic. But an actual visual TV show, and it's got to be TV, none of this movie stuff. Stop with the movies based on old television shows. Because Star Trek proves it that when you have the hour long format, you can really tell your stories well. But when you go for the movies, all you're doing is just big special effects. I'm a little worried about that when it comes to V with Kenny Johnson. He's bringing back V as a uh, movie uh, via Desi Lu Productions, actually, of all things. Um, they've started working out the deal on that. And I worry that something will be lost. But if Kenny's involved, it'll still have that heart, which is what I'm counting on. So. My argument is Blake 7, TV show, now we need it more than ever. I also put it to you, and I'll put a link for episode one in the show notes if you're interested in taking a look. If you've never watched Blake 7, I don't know how long they'll be there because the BBC often goes through and, and does a little you know, searching, and rightfully so. It's their product. I just wish then if that's the case, then how about making it available for consumption? Uh, rather than just through, you know, the market there in England, there is definitely an audience worldwide for Blake seven. It's there. They remember it. Well, okay. I, I lied. They don't remember it. Cause I, I've mentioned it to a number of people and they're like, never watched it, never heard of it. So maybe you need to work on the marketing of that. Anyway, here's to 40 years of Blake seven. Hopefully before we hit 50, we can say, wow, that reboot was pretty good. So we're going to take a quick little break here, and when we come back, we're going to wrap up the show. What the hell is this, the wonderful Billy Flynn? Just some podcast that's supposed to be geeky, Podcasting's Rich Sigfrid. Did you try it? I'm not going to try it. You try it. S screw that noise. I'm not going to try it. Hey, Flinstress, let's get Mikey. Do you mean critically acclaimed comedy rock star Mikey Mason, who hosts the Beer Power Time Machine podcast? Yeah, but he won't listen. He hates everything. <laughs> I'm critically acclaimed comedy rock star Mikey Mason. I don't often listen to podcasts, but when I do, make mine Geek Radio Daily. 
Hey, hey, man, that, that's a different promo. Between love and madness lies Geek Radio Daily. That's kind of accurate. There are some things money can't buy. GRD is free online. Maybe she's born with it. Maybe it's Geek Radio Daily. Eh, we'll take it. Geek Radio Daily. All the geek without the weight. GeekRadioDaily.com the Emperor, you're listening to the Sci-Fi Diner Podcast. Eat it. Welcome to the Sci-Fi Diner Podcast. Join us, your hosts, Miles P. McLaughlin and Scott Herzog, as we serve up a delightful menu of science fiction interviews and news in the television, movie, DVD, and book world. Test your geek cred with trivia. Top off your meal with the Sci-Fi 5 and 5. Come visit the Sci-Fi Diner podcast at sci-fi diner podcast.com or subscribe to us in iTunes. We're serving up sci-fi from here to the end of the universe. All right, so wrapping this up here, and we'll probably wrap it up just a little bit earlier here than I, I wanted to, but uh, considering it was a one-man show, I think... I'm satisfied. Anyway, I think I got my message out there. I just wish there had been others here who could have talked about how wonderful this show was or disputed me and said, no, you're wrong. The show sucks. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, next week we're going to be talking about, and I mentioned it uh, just before the break there, V. It's the 35th anniversary of the original television show. When I say we, this time I do mean we. I For the next couple of episodes, I've actually got quite a number of people who've said they're interested in the topics at hand. We're going to be talking about V. We're going to be talking about the 35th anniversary of Star Wars, um, uh, Return of the Jedi, and Superman the movie. It's the 40th anniversary of Superman the movie. Everybody's going on about the 80th anniversary of Superman overall as a concept with the comic book and all, but Superman the movie turns 40 this year as well, and I think that was nice that they actually timed the release of the movie for the 40th anniversary of Superman back then. But we're going to talk about the original, not the TV show, not the final battle. We'll get to those at some point, uh, because honestly, you have to look at the original miniseries as an entity unto itself, even though the other properties did build on it. The one thing missing in those other properties is the stabilizing force, the thing that actually gave the whole thing its heart, and that being Kenny Johnson. So we're going to talk about that. We've got a group of guys coming on, guys. Um, I'm working on getting some some female perspective in here as well. But uh, we'll be talking about V, the, the miniseries. And like I said, you know, I'm all about the nostalgia. So do you guys remember the first time, well, actually, it'd probably be the second time, because if I remember correctly, they showed V, uh, the miniseries in 83, and then just before V, the final battle, they showed V, the miniseries again, and they ran this promo. Tonight is your chance to see how it all began, to relive the excitement that is V, the most extraordinary miniseries ever. A daring TV journalist struggling to uncover the startling truth behind the alien's visit to Earth. And a beautiful and brave young scientist fighting for the very survival of the human race. Together, they take you on a fantastic journey to meet the visitors. Prepare yourself for a television event that's out of this world. Prepare for the next. I'm actually going to be sitting down tonight and watching part one and then watching part two tomorrow night to prepare for this. I am really looking forward to it. You know I'm a big Kenny Johnson fan. Bionic Woman, six million dollar man, loved Alien Nation. I even loved Steel, his movie. I know a lot of people kind of put that down. I thought it was a great little movie. Um, so we're going to be talking about that next week. Now, here on the network itself, just a couple of things to be looking out for. New episode of the Weekly Podioplex coming along this week. And I'm sure there's going to be big news about just how wonderful uh, Infinity Wars, the Avengers movie is. Haven't seen it yet. Actually, that's going to be this afternoon. Um, but I'm going to hold off on talking about it here for a couple of weeks. I'll wait till the end review episode to get into my thoughts so this way we let a little time pass again like with lost in space before we get into spoilers um also keep an eye out tomorrow on youtube and here on facebook where we're going to be releasing the next episode of the classic public access show 1992 we sat down with uh greg cox esther friesner and terry bisson three authors and together with andrea and keith the five of them 
crafted a short story. It was kind of one of these round robin things where one would start it and then the next person would pick up with the with the threads. And all they had was just a couple of ideas that they were given at the beginning to work with. And they sort of had to pass it off. And I think after a while, they were just trying to one up each other and see who could uh, try and write them into a corner and see if the other one could write them out. But it did become a short story called Candy and the Biker Dinosaurs. The plan was that we were going to write it up afterwards and try and see if we could get it published in some magazine. Then the proceeds would go to Gay Men's Health Crisis. Unfortunately, we couldn't find any magazines interested. Even though you said it's got the byline of Terry Bisson, uh, Esther Friesner, and Greg Cox, they weren't interested. But it still was a lot of fun. And it actually became, along with many other things we've done here on The Rift, a yearly tradition to do a story weaving episode and at some point i'd like to bring that and, and and a number of things we used to do on the old public access show back and we will be talking about that here in the weeks to come so that's going to do it then i think this is a good time to just end it now because otherwise i'm going to be just rambling too much that's going to do it for this episode of the chronic rift podcast make sure you're heading on over facebook here chronic rift.com chronic underscore rift for twitter uh, just to keep up with what's going on here and in pop culture news. So until next time, folks, thank you so much for listening, for watching here this morning. Everyone have a great week, and we'll see you next week when we're talking V.